Facebook friends and family. How are you all doing today on this beautiful sunny day? As you can see, even with the blinds down, there's these little trails um, glistening down my shoulder now versus my arm, which I guess is better. So I'm going to sit like over here a little bit more relaxed and uh, not let those get in the way of my face. Um, but today's study is the sin that does not and the sin that does lead to death. Um, and it's from 1 John 5, 16 and 17. So that's chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. And while it's not um, something in my 25 years as a Christian, um, I've actually ever heard a pastor um either at one of my churches and or um, through Bible study or or on television or at an event actually speak on. Um, in my devotions the other morning, I um, read over and uh, happened to come through these verses and really did... Uh, kind of walked away a little bit unclear as to what um, John was trying to say. Uh, so, of course, I dug in, did my uh, scriptural research, um, and then did a little bit more this morning and then decided that uh, it would definitely be something worthwhile to speak on since it is not widely spoken on. But before diving in, in to chapter 1, I mean, excuse me, 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, um, I'd like to take a much granular look at the verses before we actually begin reading them. Because I think that will help um, us to better understand what John is saying here because unlike the approach that I took, which was the natural approach, in this study, I can sort of back us into the verse so that the verse takes on the meaning that it should um, because we'll be doing the homework first. So first, let's hone in on a few key phrases that John uses during these two verses. Um, and the first one is, and when you see me do quote, means exactly what he's saying. Um, if anyone sees, and what this implies is close personal relationship um, with others of like faith. Um, as well as repeated patterns of behavior, which could be good behavior, sinful behavior, all the things that we face as, as Christ followers in everyday life. Now, another thing that is consistent with John's writing through the entire epistle is the reference um, that he uses where he says, his brother. Um, and that could be simply replaced with his sister as well, um, which is to be taken as a reference to true believers, those who have accepted Christ um, and for the most part are living for him, unlike those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So when you hear John say that, he is talking about other believers. Um, and diving in a bit more on the key phrases in verses 16 and 17, let's look at the phrase committing sin, um, which speaks of a pattern or a habit of sinful nature. Um, and a very important um, phrase that is not leading to death, which refers to sins of ignorance, foolish passion, fertility, um, personal weakness. You know, you just messed up 
um, and momentarily fell into temptation. But to repent, we must look at the phrase John uses where he says, he shall ask. Now, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about the person repenting, um, which is humbly asking. And this is the believer's role, you know, in the God part, your part, relationship that we have with him um, in the intercession and restoration from our sinful nature. Um, now, obviously, Christ is the true redemption for our sins, but we are still called to um, confess our sins um, first and foremost to God, but also to one another. So it is something that he shall ask. Um, and lastly, but far from last in the phrase that God will give him life, meaning physical life versus um, spiritual. Um, so God will restore life um, versus, um, excuse me, God will give life in the physical as opposed to a restored spiritual life. Um, but he also does both, but the reference is that he shall give him life. And that is really in the context of referring to physical life but also in parallel spiritual life. Um, and sorry for, for blundering that up uh, between trying to stare away from the glaring sun and keep in track with my notes. Um, it does become a little bit uh, uh, tedious at times. But, um, and to the one who witnesses, now this is, something that you're going to see at the beginning of the scripture um, in verse 16 that to the one who witnesses his brother or sister committing sin their prayer should be as John alludes Lord restore my brother and use me to do it so however for the sin that leads to death that John will also speak of in verse 16. Um, there are also a couple of phrases in particular that I think would be helpful for us to hone in on. And that is the first one again, the quotes. There is a sin that leads to death. Um, so what John is saying, and you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because that would negate um, the rest of our study, is there is a kind of sin, and though not specified to be a specific sin, um, it does lead to death. Um, and that will become more apparent as we dive into the remainder of this study. And the second point I want to bring out where John is talking about the sin that leads to death is he says, I do not say that one should pray for that, meaning the sin that leads to death. So he's essentially saying, I'm not telling you to pray for the person who has um, partaken in the sin that led to death. Um, and he says that because there is a time where we must turn our face away and say, God, do what you want. I will accept it for when this occurs even the person who is committing the sin that leads to death has reached the point of not being capable of repentance. And you will understand this a little better as we move through this study. So what are some of the reasons, you know, and these were questions that were going through my mind that John might be telling 
us. I am not asking you to pray for this person um, engaged in sin that leads to death. Um, why wouldn't I want to pray for them? Um, you know, and different scholars have different opinions on some aspects of that, but they all do come to one common ground. Um, and we will just, you know, we'll discuss that and, and really hone in on that um, in a little bit. But because of what happened to those who sinned unto death, they have become so hardened spiritually that prayer could not change them. Their spiritual awareness has like completely died. They have gone down a path disregarding all truth, which restroy, destroys the ability to respond to truth. And they have stifled spiritual impulses. Um, second, they have decisively rejected the truth. So they are deliberately rejecting the truth. Um, and again, these are some of the things that some scholars share um, or have varying opinions on, but ultimately the one that they all agree is that they have already died as a result of the sin. And prayer will no longer do them any good. So it's in God's hand and his alone. So when we look at some biblical references of names that you um, will be familiar with, and I may or may not pronounce a couple of them exactly right, that experienced the sin that led to death, and they were all different sins, but they all had the same outcome, they led to death. We've got Moses, we've got Nadab and Abihu, um, A-B-I-H-U, and then Yusa, um, U with two Z's and an A-H. And then as most of us know from the New Testament, um, Ananias and Sephira, as well as a host of um, people from the church of Corinth. So bringing this a bit closer to home, John is saying that such prayers are unnecessary. If a person commits sin that leads to their own death, we don't need to pray about it, um, but pray instead about those who are still living, um, no matter how serious their sin might be. In other words, it is wise for Christians to pray for people who are caught in sin and help rescue them from these sins so they don't die. Once a person has died because of sin, we do not need to pray for them any longer because they are in the hands of God. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, there's multiple ways to be present with the Lord. There's you know, well done, good and faithful um, servant, and there's get away from me, I never knew you. Um, so prayer for the sins of the deceased accomplishes nothing. But prayer for those who are still alive obviously can, can accomplish much. So when read this way, the verse about the sin unto death not only makes more sense in context, but also makes sense in light of the rest of scripture and in our own experience as well. For example, we all know that there are certain behaviors and actions which can lead a person to an early grave. But aside from that, there are even some sins which may cause God to discipline a person with early death. Um, those who did not properly observe the Lord's Supper are an example. Um, 
if you read 1 Corinthians 11.30, their sin led to death. Uh, there is also the example of the man who was boasting about sleeping with his stepmother. Um, doesn't even sound logical, but again, in 1 Corinthians 5.5, um, chapter 5, verse 5, um, that is mentioned where his sin led to death. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, there is a whole list of regenerated people who died as a result of the rebellion against God. So sin that led to death. Um, then as previously mentioned in Acts 5, 1 through 11, that is where the story of Ananias and Sapphira um, who withheld money, lied, um, were immediately committed to death as a result of their sin of lying. Um, you know, so ultimately leading them to the sin that leads to death. So the sin unto death is not a sin to spiritual death but rather it leads to a physical death. Um, so I think, you know, now that we've gone through that, hopefully you're in a much better position um, to grasp the verse. And, you know, I pray you have understanding now because I know many pastors tend to stay away from such teachings but they're in the Bible. Um, they're as much a part of God's word as promises of prosperity and love your neighbor and, and everything else. And they are to be taken equally as serious. Um, you know, John was not just an apostle, but um, I mean, he was still a man. He was still flawed, but he was not just an apostle. Um, he wrote the gospel of John. He wrote three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He wrote the book of Revelation. Um, he is the one that Jesus entrusted his mother to after his death on the cross. Um, he is the one that is referred to as Jesus's friend. Um, you know, Jesus was holy human and holy God even though he gave up his godly rights while here on earth um, to walk with us as we walk through each and every day. The only advantage he had over us in walking through the day was that he could not give up, that he intimately knew the Father. Um, you know, so again, um, very important scripture and I'm glad I had the opportunity to be able to share some of the insight on these verses before I read 1 John 5, 16 through 17 to you, um, starting with verse 16. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, and again, go back and remember the quotes and the explanations. So I'll start over again because I meant to say that first. But if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin though that leads to death. And in that case, that's me paraphrasing a little, I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. So anything contrary to God is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death, um, which we went through in the study and explained. So I pray that this verse now speaks out to you, um, even if you weren't familiar with it, you are now, um, but that the clarity of this verse came out in 
our study that we had today. Um, and I pray that it brings you even closer to the Lord, um, more intrigued with his word, um, gives you hope that when you read a verse or a chapter um, and you kind of shake your head that there are resources out there to help us to dive in and to better understand. Don't just brush it under the rug and say, oh, I just don't understand it. Um, but definitely make sure that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within you and that you've received him because he will help bring these things to your remembrance. He will help bring clarity to you. Um, and he will help lead you in the right direction to the resources that are available to us in this time and day to help us to better understand what the Greek and the Hebrew translated into and what some of these verses were really getting at um, because of the context and the limitation of the English language. It makes it so difficult sometimes for us to truly convey it. Um, and obviously it's a lot easier for us to um, become masters of research than it is for us to become masters of the Hebrew and Greek. So may God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. And as always, um, share this with your friends and uh, definitely let your friends know about Reflections of a Savior. Um, and feel free to comment and let me know what your thoughts are on anything that um, is posted. Would love to have a discussion with you. And even if there's something that's weighing on your heart that you would like, um, you know, me to talk about, um, I'd be happy to, as long as I, you know, of course, feel that God has empowered me and given me the wisdom to speak on that um, through his guidance, not through my flesh, because you don't want to listen to me. You only want to listen to me when I'm listening to God. So um, on that note, have a blessed day and enjoy wherever you are. Enjoy whatever closeness to sunny weather like I have today, even though it's cold. Um, as possible. All right. Thank you and love you all.